welcome. Thank you for clicking on this video about Demoforcus Lowii, a care collab together with Karin's Orchids and Teeny More Than Just Orchids. And ta-da! After three years of owning this orchid, this is what I've got to show for. It is a seedling and it will be a seedling for a very long time. Now, I can't show you any blooms. Clearly, if you know Demophorcus lowii, they have to be like five times this size before they even think about blooming. And they are so, so slow. That is why I'm going to show you some pictures that I got mine in April of 2018. And I saw how the lower leaves were failing quickly and I supported them with some bamboo skewers in the hopes of saving them, which did not work, but it was worth a try but you can see that I put it straight into semi-hydro. Then in January of 2019, when I got my pots and mask set up here, I thought this one deserves to be put into a nicer setup than a recycled tub. And I switched it over when I saw a new root coming out of the base. I switched it over into, again, Lekka, but this time with self-watering in the hopes that I wouldn't have to move it for a long, long time. So that was in January of 2019. Risky business, risky business. When we get to the temperature <laughs> between what I do or did in January as opposed to what it likes. Then when I started my channel in 2020, it looked a little bit different yet again. But since then, here we are. Not much has changed. And probably I'm going to revise what I said in 2020 that I projected the blooming time to be 2030. I'm going to move that up a little bit to 2040. <laughs> yes, I doubt I will ever see blooms on this orchid. And that brings me to the next question. Why on earth am I growing it when what we do is grow the orchids so that eventually we get to see the blooms? Well, it's a challenge. It doesn't take up much space. There weren't many around back in the day. I got it for, I don't know, 20 euros or something like that. And then I thought, well, I'll give it a go. And I was hoping that to be successful. It was a little bit of hit and miss for the first few months. Uh, and then in January, when I potted it again, the cold temperatures in January are definitely not what this orchid likes, but I think we've steadied and settled the ship now. So apart from in Sweden with Karin's orchids and the United States with TD more than just orchids, I am in Southern Spain. It is actually naturally found on the island of Borneo, but on the western side, northwest, and then down southwestern side, the Malaysian side, not Indonesia and not in Brunei. But especially in the Sarawak region, in the hill and lower mountain forests, and also in gullies and ravines, tall trees overhanging water at elevations of sea level up to 1,800 meters. Then it's also been seen in the Sabah region up north, specifically in the Tambunan area of the Trusmadi Forest Reserve. So I'm growing mine in Lekka and self-watering because it is still a seedling and it will be for quite some time. And also because of my low humidity, because where it comes from and where it thrives on the Malaysian side of Borneo, the least amount of rain this orchid gets in a 12 month period is in June of 220 millimeters in that entire month. For half the month, the highest humidity imaginable, topped by the fact that it overhangs rivers and it is considered a vendacious orchid, I doubt very much it is possible to grow this as a regular vendacious orchid. See, in its natural habitat, the amount of rain it gets per year is 207 days, with torrential downpours during, for example, the month of June with the least amount of rain, but torrential downpours nonetheless <laughs> for the entire month in the afternoon. So this orchid likes it, hot and steamy, but then it gets better the amount of water this orchid requires. January is considered the wettest month with 685 millimeters of rain and 22 days of rain per month. The fact that this is a warm to hot grower would be considered an understatement. 23 degrees Celsius being the lowest temperature and the average normal temperature is around 32 degrees Celsius. 
that is more common. Throw in some of the seasonal cyclones and you have yourself the perfect steamy, humid, wet soup that this orchid loves. None of what I've just described is what mine has to tolerate. Considering it has all this ambient demand in its DNA, I have it in self-watering and I keep it in bright light, but always shaded. If you think of the jungles that it's coming from, yeah, that's not a lot of sun that it gets. I've got mine a little bit brighter shade than it might like. As you can see, I'm getting anthocyan in here which is okay, but it never goes into direct sun unless now that I'm filming it. It's on the lowest shelf of my rack on the east side of my grow space of the patio. And when the sun shines, there is a curtain to protect it. And then when it, the shade has encroached on that space, I take the curtain away. So it does get bright light. And I leave it on the lower shelf, not just because of the shade factor, but because my terracotta heats up very, very quickly early in the morning when the sun hits it, and that gives it some heat from below, despite the fact that my ambient temperatures at this point still are not quite to its liking. My night temperatures at the moment are 19 degrees, and we are at the end of May. My day temperatures are 23, 24 degrees, so I'm only just hitting its preferred temperatures during the daytime, but not at night. I'm really trying to tiptoe my way around with this orchid, especially in the winter in my climate where the cold is just so not its mojo at all. My dining room temperatures can go down to 14 degrees Celsius. So A, it doesn't live outside all year round and B, my temperatures indoors are so not to its liking whatsoever. But it can take it, the only thing that happens is that it slows a little bit down in its growth, even slower, if you can believe it. It still hasn't kick-started its actual growing period. I am seeing that there is a leaf growing, a new one coming out here, but it really has not got going yet. And when I say, can you tell whether it's got going or not, um, in six months, <laughs> we can have a look-see and see if that leaf has maybe reached there. I get about five centimeters of growth per year on any given leaf that comes out. That's sort of where I'm kind of looking at to see whether it is gonna be growing okay. Once my temperatures warm up, that'll make it much, much happier. But for the reasons of keeping it as hot and warm as possible, despite being outdoors now, is the terracotta just underneath the pot where it lives and that really really cranks up the heat in that little microclimate down there. Then when I go around with my garden hose I give that terracotta a really good hose down and then the humidity rises even though by a fraction I'll never get to 80% what this one likes. I will never have a hot steaming sauna kind of atmosphere here in southern Spain. I am so dry, my humidity is about 30% throughout the eight months of the year. The fact that this orchid is still alive, I am super pleased, considering that I got it probably with seven leaves and we are down to one, two, three, well, one, two, three, four, and a fifth one is coming, but it doesn't replenish the leaves fast enough as it was dropping leaves in the early days. So what I do, with regards to fertilizing it. Being such a slow grower, there really is no need to keep fertilizing it a lot. You can see I made the mistake early days and I have fertilizer burn on the leaves here. And that was when I was going at it with 300 parts per million of Hermes U fertilizer, which is absolutely and totally unnecessary. Now I've dropped that down to 100, 160 sometimes and it's not always got fertilizer in it. More often than not, it's just plain RO water in that reservoir, especially during the winter. It's not going to grow in my temperatures, so I don't want to tax it with something it's not going to absorb. Now, I'm slowly kickstarting with the fertilizer very, very gently. First, I started with calcium and magnesium at 100 parts per million because my tolumnias occasionally get that. So this one, I have treated like a tolumnia when it's just starting to get going. The other day, I gave it a little bit of a silicon soak 
but it is the flushing that I do more regularly than anything else. Even though it may not be absorbing the reservoir that much, I do flush this one almost every third, every fourth day because I have not repotted it since January 2019. That will make it now two years, close to two and a half years. And if you've been on my channel, you know that I like to look at my roots in the self-watering setup maximum three years. I probably won't do that with this one. This is not something that is notorious for not liking its roots disturbed. But as long as I have the features of my pot where I can see and feel or aeration going through the pot as I flush, when I fill up the pot, I get a good gargle. Sorry for the jiggle. I get a good gargle going. I can hear there is aeration going through the pot. Then I don't want to disturb this orchid for as long as I possibly can get away with it. The roots are doing fine. I have a little bit of a dieback on a root tip here. That is humidity. Yes, lack thereof. But other than that, just one moment, there is an active root tip. Keep turning and not touching and snagging anything. There is an active root tip in here, if the lecker would permit me, right there. And it is coming out from underneath the pot. Not concerned. I don't care that these roots do what they want. You can see how high I have the base up there. I didn't worry about keeping this lower in the pot. The idea being that there's always moisture around the roots, not only because it is a seedling, but because of its natural habitat being just wet and dripping with water, rain, humidity, heat. That to me interprets Lekka and self-watering, especially in my super, super dry climate. I will not increase the fertilizer beyond 160 parts per million. It's going to be absolutely fine. If it's that slow in growing, it's not going to absorb the fertilizer anyway. But yeah, this is my Dimophorcus loei after three years in Spain. Let's see what it does this summer. Let's see how this leaf progresses. If all goes well, I'm estimating it'll be up to here by October, November. <laughs> I love this orchid, whether I'm gonna see the blooms or not. And I think the latter is absolutely more favorable. I will not be seeing the blooms of this one, but who knows? Maybe one day somebody will remember ninja orchids and say, aha, leave a legacy behind. Great orchid, it's not in the way. It has adapted to my climate and I wouldn't wanna be without it. So thank you very, very much to Karin's Orchids, TD More Than Just Orchids, for joining me on this care collab of Dimophorcus Loei. And again, I'm going to extend the invitation to anybody that watches this video, who does videos, who uploads to any form of social media, and who wants to join in on the care collab updates, videos of Dimophorcus Loei in the future, to leave me a comment it below please i will add you to the list and be more than happy to reach out to you the next time we look at this orchid i can't promise you that anybody has their orchid in bloom but i don't know thank you so very very much for watching please go check out karin's orchids and td more than just orchids let's have a look see what their lowy eyes look like have a wonderful day everybody please stay safe and take care bye